Welcome back to the Gut Check Project, episode number three. We are still here and loving it. What do you think? Well, are we going to keep doing this till we're like episode, like Joe Rogan, episode number 2068, they still let us back on. 2068 means we only have 2065 to go. There we go. We're getting closer. We are getting closer. So uh, thank you again for joining us. Uh, the feedback is, uh, well, it's awesome. It's, uh, it's impressive. I had no idea that this... Many people in such a short amount of time would want to hear what we had to say about bridging the gap between health uh, in uh, natural and medical science. Absolutely. I love it. We've been, uh, in fact, one of the things we'll get into here shortly is I've been messaged by a bunch of people. I've had a lot of uh, friends from, you know, all over the United States contact us and say, hey, that was, that was interesting. You guys were covering some cool stuff, especially last week. We had Sean Bryan's on. If you did not check it out, please uh, deep dive into CBD and uh, a little bit into the cannabis industry, but really cool. Such a deep dive that the material was so informative that uh, YouTube, of course, allowed us to keep spreading the message. But Facebook pulled pulled our, our, uh, our recording down for a little while and we had to replace it with YouTube. So I guess if you want to know the truth, then sometimes Facebook's going to going to slow down a little bit. Well, that's, and we covered those topics. Like they obviously did that because of the particular topic that we were talking about. Sure. But we were all about the science of it. We're showing everything. That's what we're going to do. We're going to continue to do this. And today, what? who do we have on our show? Today, we're going to be joined by Chef Patrick Mosher. Now, if you uh, listen to the Spoonie Network already, Chef Patrick Mosher is already somebody who you're quite familiar with. However, this guy's got experience from all different aspects of cooking for gigantic hotels, being a part owner of some large chains and putting together the food islands. Every, essentially, he's he knows how to build food and uh, how to make something out of it. His message is you are what you eat. My message is all health begins and ends in the gut. This is why teaming up with chefs and getting out there is going to be super cool and thrilled to have him. He's actually the producer of our show. So this is going to be, if any reason to tune in, it's going to be that we're going to move him over here, and he's going to be a guest. So we had to, on the fly, he had to, on the fly, teach Eric's wife, Marie, uh, to run the uh, to the production desk over there. So if anything, let's just stay tuned for that because, you know. Is a camera? Is it where it's supposed to be? Don't be mad at her. She's yeah. doing what she can do. She just learned how to do it two seconds ago. Hey, you can't blame her for me setting the camera up incorrectly. <laughs> Wait, can't blame her. You got to blame me. That's right. Either way, it doesn't matter. It'll be fun, though, regardless. Uh, speaking of, let's get caught up on our on our recent week, weekends. Um, anything big happened with, uh, with you and your fam this last week? It's pretty chill. Something kind of cool. I just mentioned a little bit about how... Um, People have been messaging us. Now, remember, we are the Gut Check Project. Our right. phrase is, check your ego at the door. Everything's on the table. And uh, somebody had messaged me uh, on Instagram and asked, why do, we, why do we say Gut Check Project? Why do I check your ego at the door? Coincidentally, last week was actually my birthday on our show. And I, <clears throat> I read a book written by Ryan Holiday called the daily stoic all this is it's kind of a fun little way to start your day right there's every single day he takes a lesson from a stoic philosopher and he kind of dumbs it down and gets it through it okay so march 14th was one that i had i thought it was way too coincidental that somebody messaged me for this and this was the actual thing so bear with me um while i explain this but it makes total sense to me and this is the kind of stuff i like to start my day with so the quote is from Diogenes Laertes. Zeno would also say that nothing is more hostile to a firm grasp on knowledge than self-deception. So what I like about it, Ryan Holiday then breaks it down, basically says self-deception, delusions of grandeur. These aren't just annoying personality traits. Ego is more than just off-putting and obnoxious. Instead, it is the sworn enemy of our ability to learn and grow. As Epictetus said it, it is impossible for a person to begin to learn what he thinks he already knows. Today, we will be unable to improve, unable to learn, unable to earn the respect of others if we think we're already perfect and a genius admitting it. So 
That was the philosophy that you and I had when we were setting up this show. It's gut check project. Check your ego at the door, sit down, and let's learn from each other. Let's teach each other. And that's why we have a chef on today. Yeah. Because we're going to learn a little bit about food. Right. We definitely will learn a little bit about food. Um, How about you? Oh, well, it's a good question. So uh, speaking of my wife, who is going to be working the cameras today for our show, thank you, Marie. Um, This this last weekend, we spent our time with my boys putting down a new floor on the chicken coop. Uh, So... My wife has had experience in the past where we've had our own chickens and we harvest our own eggs. It's the best tasting eggs you can possibly imagine. But if you like spending around $72, $73 an egg, get yourself some chicken filled chicken <laughs> coop because it's awesome. They taste terrific. Love you, hon. They're great. Um, that reminds me because um, I do believe that you guys tried some beekeeping at one time. Yeah. Uh, you and I put together, uh, well, we have taken care care of some patients which um i'm sure they'd be okay with me saying it that they were beekeepers so there was a um dr robert bender was a gynecologist in town unfortunately he died of cancer but it was the funniest thing i'm having lunch with him and he's talking about how him and his wife decided to get into making honey he goes oh it's fantastic he goes i'm a gynecologist i know how to deal with women i just have to you know treat one queen really good and i get all this honey and we're selling this honey it's local natural honey it's seven dollars and sixty cents a bottle only cost me 28 per bottle (laughs) (laughs) exactly what you're saying and i love that guy and i love that quote unfortunately you know he's passed on but i like it when people take risks like that and kind of own it yeah you know completely own it talk about checking your ego at the door i'm going to tell you that we're having fun doing it and we're not making any money the farm fresh eggs taste great we just got to get to a point where we don't have our dogs take the chickens out <laughs> that's all there's to it hey you there's mentioned goals. A, you mentioned a book and something's really cool it's last week do you remember getting this book from isabella wentz i did yes you and i both received this fantastic book isabella wentz is an amazing phd why don't you go ahead and explain it so uh ken and i fortunately met uh, met isabella and her husband uh it's a year and a half ago when we were working in san diego and uh, she was diagnosed with Hashimoto's. And uh, she then, after she was diagnosed with Hashimoto's, she went on to change her diet, eliminate uh, some of her trigger uh, trigger foods like gluten and dairy-containing foods, and then began to find that she could eliminate that, that uh, inflammation and put herself on a road to recovery. It's not any different than what you wrote out of uh, what you read out of the Stoics book. The reason that we started Gut Check Project, what uh, Doctor or uh, what uh, Chef Patrick's going to join us and talk about how you can control how you feel with great food. It's no different. So, thank you very much, Isabella. For Isabella the book. and um, your husband. I forgot his name, but we'll find that out. And uh, you know, thank you so much for sending us the book. Definitely going to read this. Going to recommend it to my patients. Uh, you've done an amazing job of Hashi, moving. Yeah, Hashimoto's Food Pharmacology. Food pharmacology. It comes with a full meal plan at the very back, with uh, all the way down to exactly what to buy, I and mean, just like any other recipe book. But it's it's high quality. It tells you why why you're doing what you're doing, not just eat this and. Figure Here's it out. what we'll do. We'll all um, we'll all read it. Then we'll come back and do uh, like a sort of synopsis of it. But once again, Isabel, thank you so much for doing that. Super smart woman. I love talking to her when we were in San Diego at the Mindshare meeting. That was awesome. Definitely. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, Let's see, some quick catch-up uh, for listening here on Spoonie. Don't forget, if you want to drop by and pick up some lovemytummy.com forward slash Spoonie for your own Autron Teal, you get a discount for using Spoonie as the discount code, as well as check out KBMD Health and get your brand new KBMD CBD at our new store. So if any of you have ever read Isabella Wentz's books or if you've enjoyed the show at all, we are all trying to support each other. This is a rising tide will lift all ships. One way to do that is to actually go to these websites, purchase a product and use those codes so that everyone is trying to help each other out. We want to make sure that Chef Patrick has a successful show and his network grows and the Spoonie Radio digital platform becomes massive and one way to do it is definitely going on and supporting our sponsors without question without question well we'll get moving here we're in our first half hour and uh, kind of the format is that um, we touch on health matters as they come through kbmd health for us to talk about here on the gut check project so ken why don't you tell us a little bit about what is on your mind health wise today 
So one of the things, I mean, I'm a complete nerd, so we want to geek out at some point in this show. <laughs> and w- I was thinking of the um, articles. I, I basically spent my nose in journals all day long, and so I just try and figure stuff out. But then I came across this really cool article about the science of food, and it, it just falls perfectly into this Hashimoto's food pharmacology, and we're going to have Chef Patrick on here. So, you know, food is fascinating. Why do we like that? I mean, it does so many things. You've got texture, you've got smell, you have taste, the consistency of it. There's a whole science called food pairing Scientology or science. Science, yeah. Science. Technology. Technology, yeah. So it's food pairing technology. Okay. Where you look at this and you can actually manipulate what's going on. Like, for instance... One of the examples, one of the more simple examples would be like when you eat a really fatty meal, like uh-huh. a ribeye. Right. Well, the lubrication that happens on your tongue, if you do too much of it, you can balance that out with an astringent thing that actually binds the proteins and gets rid of that slimy feeling. Okay. So it's the balance. You don't want too much of anything. Guess what is very astringent? Red wine. That's how come red wine pairs so well with a good... Fatty ribeye, yeah, because it actually just gets that to go away. So I started going down this rabbit hole, found these articles, and I'm sure that this is second nature to the chefs out there. And uh, you know, they're like, "Oh, of course that is." Uh, but this is where it gets really fun. As it turns out, only twenty percent of your taste is actually happening on your tongue. Okay, eighty percent is the aroma, and it's the aroma that comes down to everything. Now, so the we perceive the aromas. Um, because they interact with our olfactory nerves. So as it turns out, these different aromas do different things and you can augment them. We talked about the entourage effect last week. You can actually have an entourage effect when it comes to food by pairing certain foods that have chemically similar aroma molecules. Okay, so, and and before you get too far while you're taking a sip, would this be similar? You said that uh, you would use an astringent to basically cleanse your mouth, it's really probably no different than using, I'm guessing, ginger whenever you're about to eat sushi. So the ginger works like that, exactly. So as it turns out, like for instance, did you know that like white chocolate and caviar go very well together? Did not. It's wild because when you put it through, when you take these foods and what these scientists are doing is they're taking the foods and they're putting it into a gas chromatograph. Okay. And what that is, is that is something that actually shows the molecular weight and you can go, oh, here's a spike, here's a spike. Um, these two foods share similar spikes. As it turns out, white chocolate and caviar share similar spikes, and that molecule is trimethylaminuria. It smells like fish. Sure it does. In fact, there's a disease on a side note called trimethyl, or I'm sorry, it's trimethalamine is the molecule. Trimethylaminuria is the one that I'm familiar with because I've actually had patients come to me, and they're like, it's weird. When I eat certain foods, People can't be around me. They're like, you have a weird odor. That's called trimethylaminuria, and it's that molecule, which is trimethylamin- uh, trimethylamine. Certain people have a genetic uh, predisposition where they can't break it down. And I've, I've looked at them and gone, did anybody ever say you smelled like fish? And they're like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, got it. And all we do is change their diet, and it's that gone. problem's gone. Yeah, so like, you start looking at some of this stuff, and the science behind it is so cool. When you're looking at the interaction, so what can happen is that you can have similar molecules that ping your olfactory nerve that go to your brain and go, oh, that's this. And then if another food pairing pings that same one a little bit, Uh a little more, a little less, so on, then it heightens the first one. So you can build your recipes and food off of the molecular structure. And, you know, beyond the whole tongue thing, you know, the sweet, salt, bitter, sour, umami, the new one, the earthy flavor. Uh, this is the way to really take your food to the next level. And much of what chefs have probably learned, you know, Michelin star rated chefs is they're already doing it without realizing that it could be based on the science of this. Sure. So for instance, like a large portion of a strawberry actually has cheesy molecules. Really? So you can sit there and pair strawberries with a certain cheese and they will augment each other. They, they will build each other up. Yeah. So really fun I never would have thought about this, checking my ego at the door. I start going down food science because we've got a chef on the show today. And then this opened up a whole thing where I found a UK website 
Now, just real quick, it wouldn't just be any kind of cheese. Surely it has to be. You wouldn't make strawberry nachos. I'm just saying, like a can of queso on top of a pile of strawberries. No, no. It has to be certain cheeses with similar molecules okay. that have this. Yeah. And so you can go to foodpairing.com, and my kids were having some fun with this today, where you can create a recipe. So, all right. So I'm going to throw it to Chef Patrick. Give me a protein, anything you want. Give me some food product, and we're going to build a recipe off it right now, okay. live. Uh, let's go with duck. Duck. So this Duck website, breast specifically. Duck breast specifically. We will start with this. Not a mallard. Yes. No. Okay, would you like it to be wild? Uh, uh, yes. Okay, wild. Now, what we're going to do is... Somebody has put a duck breast into a gas chromatograph, and they have figured out how to actually pair this. So now, foods that are similar or foods that have a molecular component that is similar include all kinds of different stuff. But basically, um, oh, here we go. I think that you should pair this with, <laughs> as it turns out, Remy Martin Cognac. That's why that was the first thing that came to my mind. First one? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, is there any sort of citrus in there? Um, I don't know. We'll find out right here. Why don't we put a citrus? Let me see if there's one. Hey, before he answers, uh, Patrick, what kind of citrus would you would you already kind of well, intuitively think of? Well, because you think of something that's sweet yet astringent, like uh, duck al orange, right? So you have this rich duck, uh, and and it's not just a fat acid thing. Okay, it's a combination of all the flavors. So I'm curious if um, if that classic pairing in particular, is one that comes up. One that would match, okay. Mm -hmm. Well, so what's so fun about this is that now we're building it. So I, a, an interesting fruit that just showed up is persimmon. Oh. oh. So we'll add that one. So now what's happening is we're building this whole recipe so you can decide how you're gonna do this. So we have the ability now to realize, okay, why do certain foods taste good? So my son Lucas and I were talking about this. We we're having fun today looking at this, and he goes, wait a minute, is this a way to pair foods so that the healthier foods will seem like they taste better. Tasty. So, like, I want to put kale and do something else with it, and I'm going to pair it with something that'll augment the cheesy flavor of something else, use less of that, more of the kale, they help each other out. I'm like, this is fascinating. I've never, ever, ever heard of using food pairings through molecular studies to possibly trick your brain into liking the food more. Making healthy food more appetizing. Making healthy food more appetizing. That's why. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. So uh, anyway, just kind of a fun little thing. So that's my nerdy clip of the uh, of the of the show. You know, I'm going to spend hours on there now. You've just ruined the next week's <laughs> worth of work <laughs> in a good way. In a good way for the no, right no, reason. No, no. no, I um. And so what you can do is you can actually um save your food pairings. And my kids were doing this also, and my daughter. Uh, Carla um, built a 40 or 50, let me look at it here. She started with sea urchin, okay. which just branched out, and we've got all kinds of stuff. Sea urchin tied to cow mozzarella, which eventually takes us to buckwheat, and you know, you could just see how much fun this could be where you could do this, and it's, it's based off the aroma. But what I loved about what Lucas said was, Let's make healthy food tastier. Sure. And do it like this. Sure. A lot of chefs probably know this, but this is a way to actually use this as this is the style that I'm going to do. When I have the Hashimoto's food pharmacology going on, I'm going to make it taste a little better. This is the way to do it. Yeah, no kidding. No, that's a that's a that's a brilliant tool that I had never been exposed to. I, I would somewhat of the idea that foods could make you smell a little bit different onions for instance i mean i love onions but if they're not grilled and you're eating fresh onions it's unless your partner is also eating onions it's uh, it's kind of a no-go <laughs> but um hey you know you and i had a discussion though and i don't want to derail us off of of building the the uh, foods to make them taste better but it wasn't that long ago you and i had a discussion about what asparagus does to urine and you said that somebody was doing a test whenever I believe you were in med school that uh, they were basically trying to figure out uh, how fast somebody could rapidly make the uh, the urine change its odor from consuming the asparagus. Do you remember that conversation? Yeah, absolutely. So back in the day, this is during my um, fellowship. Dr. Wesser um, was the was a 
pioneer in gastroenterology. He's the guy that figured out that there's such a thing as lactose intolerance. You know, we say it now like it's nothing, but somebody had to figure it out that there's an enzyme called lactase. And so he was, as a, as a scientist, and back in the day it was kind of fun because he would give us a lecture every year, and it, 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 it fantastic guy. He was in his 70s, just kind of having fun with us. He'd come part-time, you know, part-time lecturer, and it would be the same lecture, so it'd be all these pictures from, like, the 70s. <laughs> it was awesome. He made everybody eat a bowl of asparagus, and then they had to go pee, and everybody had to time when they could spell when they could smell the asparagus. And it was really funny because that was his absorption study. Sure. And um, yeah, I don't think I'd get away with that now. Where I'm just like, you know, everybody eat this. <laughs> they go pee. <laughs> Bring your pee to me so I could smell it. Yeah. You know. Yeah. What, but what, that is the. Exact. What was the takeaway whenever y'all were doing that? Though it was what? just fascinating how quickly it happened. Yeah, so I... the breakdown of the food happens really quickly, and these molecules that do this actually get into your bloodstream and get filtered through your urine. Some of them remarkably quick. So, like, you know, we have all these people. You're talking about onions. When people take allicin, which is a garlic extract, right. they will actually ooze the garlic out of their breath, out of everything, because it just gets absorbed so much. Sure. And that's one of the issues that my patients will have when they come to me. They'll be taking supplements and be like, something's wrong. I'm like, are you on allicin? They're like, yeah. I'm like, I could smell it from here. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, uh... If you happen to watch the Gut Check Project and you want us to have the ability to tackle a new subject, the best thing to do is go to kbmdhealth.com. That's kbmdhealth.com. Go to the Gut Check Project show. You'll find that there is uh, the ability to connect with us and submit something that you want us to tackle. That's really how we, the last two weeks, we've stumbled across what we've, what we've come across to talk about. You know, we covered so much ground here. I mean, wouldn't it be really cool? We were talking last week about um, bringing Dr. Blair on, Colonel Blair on, and we're going to talk about TBI. Right. Now imagine doing the protocol. Because I'm at a hospital. It's a trauma hospital. We don't have a food protocol for traumatic brain injury. We don't have a CBD protocol. We don't have a DHA or any of that stuff. Wouldn't that be amazing if we could go, we're going to give you a, a brain inflammation diet. You're going to be on these supplements, and this is the protocol that's going to happen. That's the goal of this whole thing is to bring the science in. I mean, a whole separate show would be talking about sulforaphane, which is a molecule in cruciferous vegetables, like broccoli. Well, as it turns out, it's really, really good for you. It's anti-cancer, it's anti-inflammatory, but when you cook it, the enzyme can't break it down, called myrosinase. And so, like, a little hack would be a chef. We could sit there and say, no, we're going to put some... Um, mustard seed powder on it and then it'll actually convert it so you just made your broccoli or broccoli spouts way healthier sure so if you ever get diagnosed with cancer and there's all these crazy studies about like bladder cancer and stuff like that when you do that like i would love to have a protocol a food protocol on what you're going to do the hashimoto's food protocols right there we're going to have a food protocol if you get this eventually we're headed that way not, no joke. Well, in the cruciferous vegetables, they come with DIM, basically. So you're blocking the estrogen, correct? Correct. Yeah. yeah. Now, that's uh, pretty magical. And then speaking of cruciferous vegetables, another one would be cauliflower. Just last night, my wife and I went to go eat uh, uh, pizza, an awesome pizzeria, and they actually make gluten-free pizza. The crust was made out of cauliflower. It's amazing what they're doing with cauliflower now because it tastes like great bread, and it's not bread at all. You're basically having a great cruciferous vegetable while you're eating a delicious pizza. And we're hoping they didn't spray glyphosate on it so that it's uh, it's <laughs> yeah. good all around. Yeah, a non-GMO <laughs> preservative <laughs> vegetable crust that tastes just like regular bread. So it's pretty awesome. No, I love all of those cauliflower crusts. So. It is delicious. So we've got about half a minute here before Chef Patrick's going to join us in the next half hour. Um, just a quick reminder, if you are watching the Spoonie Network, you need, or if you haven't, you need to be sure and check it out. There is also the uh, another show that is hosted by Alisa Shakespeare. Alicia Shakespeare. And uh, her name of her show is No Butts Too Big. No Butts Too Big. Apostrophe. B-U-T-S. Uh, no Butts go. Too Big. Check it out. It's a great show. And uh, we will join you in the next half hour. Right on.
Fast Track Student Loans can get your student loans out of default, stop any wage garnishments, stop collection calls, and stop seizure of your tax refund. Give yourself a break. Stop the stress and get your student loan payments down to as little as $25 a month based on what you can afford to pay. 800-709-4395. Got an old car? You can donate it, whether it's running or not, to the United Breast Cancer Foundation and save a life. They'll even come and pick it up for free. The United Breast Cancer Foundation has saved hundreds of women's lives through their free or low-cost breast screen exams. But now they need your help. The United Breast Cancer Foundation wants to save more lives through early detection by offering women free or low-cost breast screening exams. And donating your old car, SUV, or truck, whether it's running or not, helps pay for them. Plus, you get a charitable tax deduction. Help the United Breast Cancer Foundation save lives by donating your old car, SUV, or truck. Call now for free pickup. 800-245-0823. 800-245-0823. 800-245-0823. Call right now. That number again is 800-245-0823. Are you tired of high cable TV rates? Sign up for Dish today and get a $500 bonus offer while supplies last. Plus, lock in your price for two years guaranteed. Call All-American Dish, your Dish authorized retailer now. 800-570-6630. 800-570-6630. That's 800-570-6630. Offers require credit qualification, 24-month commitment, early termination fee, and e-auto pay. Restrictions apply. Call for details. And welcome back to the Gut Check Project. This is GCP, and uh, I'm Eric Rieger, joined by your host, Dr. Ken Brown. What is up? Check your ego at the door, and let's learn some stuff. Hey, guess what? We have now our second ever guest. It's our third ever show. So we figured that on our third ever show, we should have our second ever guest. We are joined to my right, the man, the myth, the legend, Chef Patrick Mosier. How you doing, Chef? Uh, that's that's quite an intro. I'm not sure I can live up to that. But thank you. I'm doing good. <laughs> I'm doing well. It's not bad for a Sunday. If, you, uh, if, if you've been living under a rock, Chef Patrick does a lot of everything. He's a chef, obviously. He also produces many of the programs here on Spoonie Radio. Uh, he drives fast. He... <laughs> Texts and drives. He doesn't sleep. He likes to smile. He likes to laugh. What am I leaving out? I only text voice text, though. Oh, voice text. And I just use the Hey Siri command. So if it comes out all garbled and funny, uh, blame Siri. Yeah, well, I just made it up. I didn't even know if it was true or not. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I do. I text. I drive a lot. You know, I drive around on the weekends between uh, here and there for uh, work and any other time off I have. So, like, the real work. So, doctors are unique persons, or they have unique personalities. Uh, Yeah. Chefs are i think they take the cake and food pun (laughs) intended i've met a lot of chefs i have a lot of chefs as patients and i am just fascinated by that lifestyle and you know thank you so much for coming on we were talking earlier about how isabella went sent us her book in the last hour and talk about how food is you are what you eat all health begins and ends in the gut and here we are we've got a chef with some serious experience you have you have done a lot i've done a few things yeah um, you know, I've worked, uh, been fortunate enough to work all over the world. Uh, I actually kind of started my culinary career in Japan. Well, actually I started my culinary career, career in a, uh, Sizzler steakhouse when I was like 14. What, what kind of Sizzler? There's Western Sizzler. It was just, it was... it was just Sizzler steakhouse. It was, um, <laughs> so Sizzler was a pretty big, cha- a pretty big chain back in the eighties and early nineties. Sure. And, um, yeah, so I was the, I was the bus boy dishwasher at the Sizzler steakhouse until Thursday nights came around. Uh, I got tips as the as the dishwasher busboy, and um, apparently on Thursdays there was all you keep popcorn shrimp. So the kitchen guy said, "Hey, we'll teach you how to run the fryer. <laughs> we'll teach you how to run the fryer." I'm like, "Okay, cool. Um, I'll run. I oh, got get to cook." So I was, you know, I was busting it out back there. You can only put ten pieces of shrimp on any given plate because it's all you can eat, right? Yeah. So the Arizona State football team would come in and they'd have thirty seven plates each or something like that. <laughs> um, so you're back there, you're you're like humping it on the fryer, and and they're back there kind of laughing at you because they get your percentage of your tips. Not only are you doing the hardest job because you have to clean the fryer at the end of the night, but they get your money. It only took me about six weeks to figure that out. Sure. And I was like, man, I'm the dumbest guy on the planet. 
But well, um, and, and and shrimp everywhere feared you. Yeah, you know what? It's interesting that uh, my first job in the kitchen uh, sent me home smelling like seafood because later, as I progressed into sushi and seafood specifically, uh, every night was like, okay, you gotta, you can't even go to bed before you take a shower because your sheets are just gonna stink in the morning, and <laughs> it's pretty nasty. But it is what it is. Were your family was your family a frequenter of a Sizzler growing up? Yes, we would do the Sizzler in Omaha, Nebraska. So yeah, salad well, bar. Remember the salad bar? Oh, well, I was just, oh, that was just going there. My favorite item there as a kid was uh, not any part of the salad, but the canned chocolate pudding for whatever reason. <laughs> Quite nutritious. It goes right alongside the uh, square uh, chicken fried steak. So this is this is what I love. I mean, it's somebody <laughs> with with your culinary chops that has gone all the way to Japan to learn. And mm-hmm. This is where you start: is frying shrimp at a Sizzler. Yeah. Sure. I lasted about two weeks at a McDonald's before that, but I don't really count that. Right? Yeah. yeah. Nobody ever does. No, I was a quitter there. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> what actually drew you to food? Um, you know, my, my father had a large garden. We, we lived in upstate New York in uh, the town of Corinth, or Corinth, if you live there. It's near Saratoga Springs, Albany, that area, kind of near the middle of the state. And um, my, my dad's entire family, all of his siblings except one brother, lived within a mile of each other on the same road. And my grandfather owned, I don't know, a few sections of land on either side. He had a dairy farm. Um, and then uh, a large uh, vegetable garden. And my father tended at least an acre garden every year. So we spent summers as I was like, you know, three, old enough to pick beans. You were picking beans and snapping beans and helping mom put stuff in jars so she could can it. And my, f- okay, I, I, I'm not sure I want to tell my first culinary job as a, a real job in the family. Um, <laughs> but actually, it's kind of right up your alley. This, this will work out well. My grandfather slaughtered two cattle every winter. And then we split the meat up but amongst the family. Sure. He usually did two more later, but uh, early in the winter, the first big heavy snowfall, they'd, uh, and so you have to string them up, right? You, you, you obviously, you, uh, how do you gently say you kill them? You just kill them. Yeah, right? you kill them. Okay. And then you well, cut this is a, it's yeah. all, on our first episode, we actually explained <laughs> my background where um, mm-hmm. Eric would go with his dad to a radio studio and I would go to the slaughterhouse. So yeah, my exactly. dad was yeah. yeah running that kind of stuff. So that's why you're saying that, so. Yeah, no, I mean, no, no, it's not actually. It's more like the uh, the gas, the GI part, the oh. the butt doctor part. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, um, no. So maybe, maybe I maybe I missed my calling. But um, before they can actually gut the animal, there's something that has to be done. So they hang it up upside down. You have to climb up a ladder, and you have to. Um, I was five years old when I was taught this. My first time. You have to cut around the the muscle around the of the anus, uh-huh. and you have to tie it off because if you don't, when the stomach elongates, it's a geyser. Oh, oh, comes out the back end. So that was my first real job for the family in slaughtering beef was I got to climb the ladder and tie it off. Tie off the butt. Oh, I know. I know. Yeah. I'd much rather have, I mean, that's, your job sounds more glamorous. That's permanent constipation. So that would make total sense while you were drawn to uh, sushi immediately. You're like, I'm getting away from this. <laughs> yeah, no more red meat. Yeah. No more red meat. Now, now you know why I gave up red meat. Not for Lent, but for several years in Japan. Uh, plus the cost. So after you had the exposure to the dairy farm and all of the vegetables, then that obviously is setting a foundation for you to get into food. You probably had no idea that's where you were leaning, but... Uh... Um, yeah, no, I didn't. I really... Uh, my mother was a great cook. My father was a good cook, a very good cook. Um, and their whole family, every, um, every event revolved around food. Okay. So uh, as I grew up, my father died very young. I was six years old. He died oh. of um, pancreatic cancer at the Ooh. age of 47. Wow. Yes. Wow. And uh, back then, there was no really no treatment. By the time they figured out why you had back pain, it was pretty much over. over. And um, But anyway, so, uh, but I spent a lot of time with my mother cooking after that. And uh, I just I just picked it up. I really love food. I'd, I had, was fortunate enough to move to Germany my senior year in high school. And the family that, uh, that I lived with that hosted me was very generous. And uh, we got to go to other countries and, and dine on some fantastic food. And food was a way of life for them. And in Germany is where I learned about minimalism in the cupboard. You know, because they have dorm style refrigerators. They don't have big refrigerators. They're slightly larger than little boxes you have in your dormitory. And they shop every day. So every single day, uh, at least once a day, you shopped, unless sure. it was for your bread because it was delivered in the morning fresh. Wow. Ooh. Mm-hmm. That's pretty interesting. Oh, it was awesome. Very. It was awesome. So, hey, just as a side note, uh, growing up and watching my grandmother cook, mm-hmm. uh, my dad's mom, she was, she was fantastic. I loved her fried chicken. Now, she fried a lot of stuff. But for some reason back then, she still remained skinny. But 
she, and I don't know if your mom or your dad was like this, my grandmother could flavor anything to taste terrific. Uh, fried chicken, chicken fried steak, uh, vegetables, etc. Uh, but one of her trademarks was to always cook with a cigarette hanging out of her lip. So I think <laughs> some of that was flavored. A little bit of Winston burn ash was in there. As well as, I think that she saved all of the different kinds of meats that she fried in, the oil in, in different Folgers cans, fish oil and and uh, chicken grease, et cetera. Is that something that y'all also did in upstate New York? Yeah, you know, and I, well, the vegetables, I think, had a different flavor. And diff- uh, we'll, we'll start there. But uh, produce, because we had a burn pile every year. We okay. had trees that would fall. We had a lot of property. And we would burn on the actual garden. So what was, and my, my father would rotate back and forth on two plots. So each season, the previous year's uh, burn pile would become the new garden. And so the, the ash content, right, the pot ash, well, the, the ash content was really high. So a lot of minerals and, um, I mean, it's, it's amazing how healthy the vegetables are when you do that. You know, people used to take the ashes from their fireplace and put them into the burn pile or into their compost heap. Sure. Um, we don't do that anymore. But that gives, that right there was just fantastic for the flavor and the freshness of vegetables. Um, but my mother, yeah, she stewed everything. Okay. Oh, yeah, except, uh, what did she call it? Uh, Swiss steak was broiled. Uh, whatever lean beef steak she could buy that was the cheapest cut with a bone in it, and then smothered in um, tomatoes and garlic, and then she broiled that in the oven. It was actually pretty good. It actually sounds delicious. Yeah. Compared to what we were talking about on the first part of the show, what I'm thinking is that you know, you know smoking it has a lot of a it's a carcinogen known as benzene. Mm-hmm. What we should do is see the chemical structure similar to benzene to add that good childhood flavor that you're missing yeah. from the smoke That's right. and the cook <laughs> without getting the cancer. Yeah. yeah, yeah, probably so. You could get you could put uh, Winston cigarettes into a mass spec machine and see if it pops out to charred meat. Figure out <laughs> well, you, figure out what fruit or vegetable has a similar molecular component near benzene. So. Now I'm inter- I'm interested. I, I'm really curious about that. Th- this is a fascinating science for me, and I'm thinking I could just uh, I could change my restaurant consulting. Uh, business to just be menu consulting based on this and take uh, elevate all chefs to the next level. Oh, yeah, absolutely. This is the kind of stuff, uh, and we wouldn't be talking about it if we weren't preparing for this show. I was just... Uh, Thought I'd d- put my water down there. I was uh, just uh, you know trying to think of, okay, what's a really cool thing that we could talk about? I have to science this up. I like it. I'm a nerd, and I'll probably try and do this with every single topic that we do, find something. But yeah, it's really fun. I'll, it's very um, cool. That would be really cool. So you're sitting there, so obviously you're exposed to this great Organic before organic was cool. Mm-hmm. You guys had an we, organic we farm. Country poor. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> country poor. You know? All right. So what happened after that? Um, well, we moved to Arizona, which was a whole different thing. And I learned about spicy, spicy foods, right? My first meal out in Arizona, we didn't eat out a lot as a child, very rarely, uh, maybe once or twice a year at the most. We went to this little Mexican restaurant. Um, between Chandler and Gilbert, Arizona, which are now massive towns that kind of grown together. But then they were just very small towns. And uh, I don't remember, it's Casa something, this little Mexican place. And I had a chimichanga Mm -hmm. smothered in spicy green chili salsa. And I went ballistic. It was was done. I was never going to do anything but eat tasty food again. And, and, And not healthy necessarily, but flavorful food. And that uh, that kind of spawned. How old were you when you moved down to Arizona? Uh, I guess I was in sixth grade, somewhere in there. Oh, wow. Grade, yeah. yeah, nice. So it would have been a few years. So then you, you progress through, you graduate, and then you end up, uh, well, before you graduated, you worked at the Sizzler. And then uh, mm-hmm. how did you decide that food, beyond being told the random days you were going to do popcorn shrimp, was something you wanted to pursue and deliver to people to make them happy? Um, well, I'd had a few other jobs cooking after that, but what I realized is that no matter how, uh, how, uh, cash, uh, strapped your family might be, there was always food in the restaurant. And if you worked there, you usually got some of it for free. Sure. So I think that was it. I think mentally, um, I determined never to be hungry again. Right. And, I uh, just parlayed into a, into a career, but I, I really didn't start cooking full time until I was in Japan. I was working as an interpreter. Uh, I was actually working as a copywriter to start and did some interpreting. So after you actually that. took a job in Japan as I a did. copywriter. I did for a company called Trans Tech International. They were a te- technical translation company. Uh, the parents of a friend of mine that had come to the United States to go to school in eighth grade and stayed all the way through high school, they owned and ran the company in Osaka, Japan, and they invited me to come and work for them after. Well, I was actually in college at the time. Wow! So I've heard you speak. German. Do you also speak Japanese? Hi, Nihongo Wow. Mm-hmm. So this is fascinating. So chefs, 
are super intelligent people. Yeah. And this is what's, no, I'm serious. <laughs> because I just think it's wild because you're, you're um, uh, many of my friends that are chefs are people of extremes. Sure. Yes, and we are. That is fascinating. You speak Japanese, German, English. Kitchen Spanish. Kitchen Spanish. <laughs> <laughs> rapido, rapido, go. Vamos, 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 vamos. No. It reminds me of Chevy Chase and uh, what is that? Uh, the Three Amigos? No. He's, he's, uh, he's uh, in Fletch. When he's oh, trying to Fletch or Fletch, he's too. Trying, yeah, no, Fletch, he's trying to escape the cops, and then he just picks up a... <laughs> He just picks up a, 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 a serving tray and he walks through and he's like, rub it all, rub it all, and he makes his way out of there. <laughs> and he gets up and gives a speech after the yeah. yes, One of my all-time favorite movies, by the Do way. Do you know how many times I have charged things to Mr. Underhill because of that movie? <laughs> oh, oh. Yeah, you better, better make that two bottles. Sandwich. <laughs> yeah, I'll have a steak sandwich and a steak sandwich. Yes. <laughs> oh, my goodness, yeah. What a great movie. So, ja you <laughs> so Japanese. Yes. Japanese, you're... So, yeah, I basically fell in love with the food there, and I just quit my job and started cooking. Wow. That was pretty much it. That, I, I just gave up what I was doing. Uh, I was working part-time at the hotel, um, the hotel, the new Otani Hotel in uh, southern Osaka, and they had a great French-Japanese uh, fusion restaurant. This is in the mid-'80s, right? Late-'80s. Um, and I, I got a job there. I was kind of like their bartender, which meant I... I poured a lot of wine and made chai. Sure. Um, but then I also got to work in the back doing uh, appetizers and odors, and, and it, was, it was fascinating. I, I loved it. And Japanese chefs are so meticulous. They have um, the way they approach food in Japan, they actually have a proverb that defines uh, food in Japan. And it's, it's, it's the, yeah, the ori. The, the ori it's at, is actually, it's, it's not just food. It's the food. It is the substance of the universe, right? So... Their philosophy is let it uh, let little seem like much as long as it is fresh and beautiful. Wow. Let little seem like much. Uh -huh. As long as it is fresh and beautiful. So um, small portions, very ornate and well garnished, very clean and seasonal. Seasonal is the key word there. And typically local. I don't want to jump too far ahead, but I do remember in one of our previous conversations, you did say that you were with uh, Nobu. As well, correct? Yeah, I did work for Nova for a number of years. Yeah, I actually, uh, I was the executive chef and uh, helped open the restaurant in Aspen, uh, oh, wow. which is Matsuhisa. That's his last name. And then I, I was fortunate enough to work at several other locations. So, I mean, I imagine that a lot of those principles that you're talking about probably carried over into the way the presentation, the food. Yeah, you know, and, well, there's a whole other layer there. I mean, he, he had lived and worked in Peru for a long time, and he was uh, fascinated by French cooking techniques. So he took these Japanese base ingredients added the layer of, um, like, infused the flavors of, of Peru and chili, and then took uh, that uh, to another level by using French cooking techniques and just phenomenal stuff. Wow. Mm -hmm. yep. I mean, I, totally, I, mean, I wish I knew what to say there. So my family, we're huge Asian cuisine fans, and it, all of it. And our favorite restaurant is actually a Japanese restaurant in Plano, and we go there at least once a week. Really? What's, yeah. I mean, you can say the name. Give them a plug. Yeah, sure. Yama. Yama? Y A M A. I'll have to check Plano. it out. Yeah, we have the. Um, it's just unbelievable. It's it, it it's good in the sense that it, I think it is very very traditional Japanese food. Um, Hitomi, our waitress, mm -hmm. is always our waitress, and so we just sit down and food just starts showing up. That's what I love. The methodical, just mm -hmm. this is what's happening. It is predictable. It is well, and it, it's thoughtful. Thoughtful. Right. Yes. So uh, here's a really interesting cultural thing from Japan. There's a great book called Amae no Kozo. It's um, the uh, the anatomy of of interdependency. Okay. Okay. It's, it describes their whole culture. One of the things in Japan is when you start a sentence, they finish it for you. Like uh, I used to teach for this guy Jonouchi. He had two small children. I spoke him. I, I taught, spoke him English. I taught them English. <laughs> now, I'm, now I actually am a native Japanese speaker, and I, it's my second day speaking English. So give me a break. Um, <laughs> so he would call and, and he would say Patoriku, and I'd say yes. He goes Jonouchi. This get it? I mean, this is Jonouchi, and he just stopped. And I'm supposed to finish it. It's like, oh, you must be calling about. But oh. I would, I didn't know that, right? So I'm just like, okay, you know, hi. I just wait for him to say something. But eventually, you learn. It's like um, Japanese interject a lot. They say hi, mm, eh, ah, so this ne. And they're what they're doing is they're, they might say yes. Oh, isn't that so? They're interjecting to let you know they're listening, actively listening. Even if they say something in agreement, it doesn't mean they agree. Okay. I mean, hmm. uh, yeah. But but anyway, 
back to the point I was making is when somebody you're uh, a guest in someone's house for the first time and you they say would you like some coffee and you say yes they don't ask you how you want it and they don't bring you the things to put cream and sugar in it they automatically put in cream and sugar because the first time as a guest in their house you should not have to think about how you want your coffee served from then on you can just make your own but they they alleviate the pressure from you even if you didn't want it that way and you accept it graciously because that's the the generosity they're giving you to relieve you of the pressure of having to say, would you please fix it this way? Oh, wow. Cool. Yeah, yeah. there's so many layers of complexity to Japan's culture. That's a whole, that's a month, uh, well, that's a whole series of shows for next year. <laughs> well, uh, you've been a chef for a long time. What would be something that in the uh, in the realm of, of uh, being a, a master chef, going from the uh, being taught Japanese and then obviously with some French uh, carry over what what take or took you to your favorite style of uh, place setting now um i think just my love of simplicity in food so as a child you know my my mother she stewed a lot of things but there were really great fresh ingredients if it wasn't stewed um my father was a big fisher and uh, fisherman and hunter and so we had a lot of wild game he had oh we always had a ton of uh you know venison and backstrap um, a lot of rabbit, a lot of fish. So everything was very simple. Um, when we went camping, my father didn't take stuff for dinner. He would hunt it or fish it. Wow. Or fish for oh, it. Oh, that's a, that's quite a bit of pressure. Yeah, no joke. Yeah, that's yeah, actually, yeah, yeah. That's it, actually a TV show now called uh, yeah. Survivor. Yeah, it's, it's, called, it's called Naked and Afraid. <laughs> yeah, Naked and Afraid, Survivor. There's a bunch of them. Bear grills. How many times did y'all go out and be like, you know what, we're not going to stay out here this time. We're going to go on back. No, you know how many times you had trout for breakfast, though? Yeah. <laughs> but he, he was, it was very simple food, so... Um, he would take uh, lemons, potatoes, uh, salt and pepper, and onion. And so if he, caught, if he caught trout, then he would simply slice up the potato and the onion, stuff it inside with a couple of wedges of lemon or uh, slices of lemon, salt and pepper, and then wrap it with a, a pat of butter in there, wrap it up in tin foil and throw it on the fire. You know, if there was other game to be had, then it was just super simple. There were boiled potatoes and uh, simple fixings and then salt and pepper on whatever <clears> the game <throat> was. And so these really clean, simple flavors for me are, are really what I identify with. Doesn't mean it can't it, it, that you can't really elevate that sure. with a few adjustments, but really um, being able to identify the main uh, component, like the center of the plate item, the protein. If you can't taste what it's supposed to taste like, um, I'm not sure what the point is. Sure. Right? Well, well, today you just you ended up joining us because you had just left a gigantic gathering that you were asked to basically help map out. How do you know whenever you have so many mouths to feed that you know? I'm going to be able to put together this kind of plate to serve this this type of convention, or do they give you parameters on what they do and don't want? How do, how do yeah, so um, the so menu development or menu um, yeah, menu development or menu selection for any large party is very very critical because you have to think about if you have to have multiple selections, especially then what is the um, what is the time to plate each item? Are they plated? Is this buffet? I mean, all that comes into play. I've done parties as large as 2,100 people. Uh, we did a, I worked for a, a company in Houston, and we did a large plated dinner for um, the, uh, oh, MD Anderson uh, Cancer Research uh, Center. The and, cancer hospital yes, there, yeah. Yes. Huge. And uh, so we, we did 2,100 people seated. But the preparation for that took a week, right? Oh. But nothing is really cooked until either some things are made the day before, but not cooked until that day. But all the proteins, like all the tenderloins, uh, all the sea bass. So there were 1,100 pieces of sea bass, and there were 1,400 pieces of tenderloin. Wow. Um, well, the tenderloins were whole. We had to cut them. No, I, I had to cut them, actually. Sure. Um, but yeah, that's, that was, we, we, all that gets cooked in ovens lined out inside of this big, giant uh, makeshift kitchen that's 20,000 square feet. Um, and then we had f 16 ovens in there, like big commercial ovens. Do you feel like that your principles and how you wanted to live, you want to deliver good health for people through the way that they eat, that I've, sometimes you get compromised because it gets so big? Yeah, I mean, uh, so there are ways to do that. Again, simplicity is number one. Sure. Um, and then limiting your, your menu to items that fit your, um, your desires and what you want to give to people and bring to people in the hospitality industry, you can't compromise that. So only serving things that, and you may look for an alternative protein. So if they couldn't afford the the tenderloin, we could do something like a, I don't know, baseball steak or, you know, tri-tip or something like that. So they get a similar quality of product, um, just not as expensive. I think that's, that's part of the creativity that chefs have to work with nowadays, um, is planning for 
an, uh, like an upcoming season. We change menus typically four times a year in restaurants. So are you primarily doing this right now for your work? Oh, so I do that. Yeah, I mean, I. I well, this is your. This, this is, is your my, new baby. I want to get into yeah, that next. Yeah, this is. This How is did it. you end up here doing a digital show? But that's what my you're dumbass doing... friend. We'll talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, love you, Doc. Miss you so much. <laughs> anyway, um, but but the planning phase is really what it is. You have to be very organized. Um, and there's a science to it. You know how many pieces of everything you need. Uh, what the portion size is, and then what your standard batch size recipe is. So you just scale that up. Although there can be complications there because salt doesn't scale directly. Um, other some other components like oil don't uh, they don't scale. You know, it's not exponential. It's not like six times this equals that. No, sure. you have to scale some things back and scale things some, some things. So up. W- what I love about this is that you're talking exactly kind of leads into the first part of the show. But this is how I cook. I view it more as a science, mm-hmm. it and is. I want to know like this and you know like i don't i didn't have a grandmother with a marlboro light in her mouth you know <laughs> to season winston, pot, seasoning winston. food winston sorry yeah yeah and, and it's so like now at this stage like i i have a really i really enjoy it, it, cookbooks so that's why i was so excited that isabella went and sent that cookbook i've got bobby flay's cookbook which is that one on a quick side note <laughs> Is that uh, it'll be like, now add this sauce. And you're like, got it. And then you turn to page 20 and you're like, that sauce has 50 ingredients. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> what? so he, that's so there's a very famous book a book, book called the um, uh, La Russa's uh, Gastronomique, right? And, uh, and there's another one by, uh, written by um, uh, August Escoffier, who, who really founded modern French cuisine, right? And the way that they cook in French kitchens. And what happens is they'll say like a uh, coquille Saint-Jacques, which is a... Uh, it's, uh, say, scallops with mm, uh, Marnier sauce or something like Meunier sauce. So you see the scallop recipe, and then it says, okay, now see recipes 42, 918, and 1126. <laughs> but when you go to one of those, the butter, the herb butter is like 97 steps. And then you have the Marnier sauce is like, uh, or Meunier, whatever, whatever sauce you end up making is like 467 steps. And you can't make it, you can't store it cold. It has to be held hot and fresh. I mean, it's just... It's so complicated that I was like, okay, that one's going back on the shelf. And uh, maybe never, I don't think I've ever dusted it back off again. I mean, I read it religiously when I was in culinary school. Yeah, I'm a terrible cook. And sometimes whenever I want to cook and I'm learning to, to piece uh, certain things together, if I see that there's a whole nether mess of steps to make one ingredient, I usually like, we're just not having any of this. <laughs> uh, it's, it's changing now. The menu, the item is off the menu. We're going to do something else. <laughs> well, and that's part of the, the, uh, the, so I'll say it on the show sometimes. Uh, I don't, I don't do show prep. Well, I prep much better for life in restaurants than I do life on the radio. Sure. And <laughs> sometimes I'll get halfway through a recipe. I'm like, wait, that doesn't make sense. Huh? No, that. And then I, I, so I spend a minute researching. I'm, oh, I didn't actually read the recipe. I just assumed that this is what they meant because this was the type of recipe. So pre-reading the recipe, knowing the ingredients and the methodology that are coming up are really important doing your prep work. Well, uh, before we end up uh, rounding out the last of this hour, since you are one of the main producers for the Spoonie uh, Digital Radio Station, we will get to why you ended up joining Spoonie Radio, et cetera. But tell us a little bit about some of the other shows that uh, Ken and I are just now joining a little so, bit. So you mentioned Elisa Shakespeare. She um, she actually has a um, – her show, No Butts Too Big, is phenomenal. She's a very energetic uh, young lady. But she had some health issues, and she owns a company called uh, Total Cluster Fudge. Which is a, which, that's, that's, isn't that awesome? Isn't that awesome? And so um, there's another new one called something monkey butts, but that one is actually that one is uh, is the healthy version of the dessert she does now for Total Cluster Fudge. And as this dessert manufacturer, she had to stop eating the things that she makes. And these uh, these are carried in um, uh, convenience stores and Costco, and they're sold over the internet, and uh, some restaurants use them as well. But she, uh, it's just great. She talks. She tells you. She walks you through healthy uh, tips and tricks to. Uh, just lead a healthier life every day. And along those lines is Gwen Rich of The Rich Solution. Rich Solution. Yeah, she's got stage four cancer for the last six and a half years. She's uh, she's lived way past her expiration date, as she and her husband uh, um, Adam say. But she was misdiagnosed for eight years before that. So she gives tips uh, on eating more uh, with uh, more nutritional value, more healthful, and how to, if you haven't been diagnosed, how to prevent being diagnosed as best as possible. Wow. And that's uh, it, the very first show I did with Doc Thompson, mm-hmm. that, you know, rest his soul. 
Yeah, um, you were supposed to sit on my show, but he's not I'm going to take him so he can get out here early. I'm like, okay, <laughs> okay, that means well, he didn't do show prep. Well, what I love is this is getting leaning into it. Like, I, I think we can do a show where we can include the chemistry and say, how do we make these things healthier? Like, increase your sulforaphane and mm -hmm. stuff like that, urolithins, all these big words that basically you're going to eat well and you're going to be healthier. Well, I don't, I mean, uh, we got room for plenty more shows. So if you want to collaborate, uh, we're ready to go. Yeah, we got. So, yeah, we got oh. a half a minute here before we have to wrap this uh, this part up. So if you're watching now, stay tuned. Uh, you can always check out lovemytummy.com forward slash Spoonie to uh, pick up Autron Teal. KBMDHealth.com, you can pick up your KBMD CBD. Next half hour, we're going to talk to uh, Chef Patrick a little bit more about not just what he's done as a chef or what brought him to Spoonie, but also you also are quite uh, experienced with CBD uh, Chef uh, Patrick and I want of, the stories. Yeah. I want the real <laughs> late night chef stories. Well, you know, stories. I was kid getting half done. We'll, <laughs> we'll talk about that. We'll see you All in right, let's do it.